Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. A mental illness doesn't have to be a life sentence. Alcohol addiction, abuse, misuse is the same all over the globe. Sparking the combos about Adelaide. So it made me feel very confident that if we did have it in the state, we were going to know about it. You should be having... There'll be guys that are trained, but they don't feel like they're good enough to take their shirt off. Almost everyone is a culprit of doom scrolling. Anyone who has a mobile phone. On Fresh 92.7. Welcome to Wavelength. Sparking the combos about Adelaide, you should be having. I'm your host, Hamish. Mission tonight. I'm joined by Jamie and David. Hello, how are you tonight, guys? Oh, pretty good. Hello, hello, hello. Fantastic. Thank you for asking, Hamish. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Not it's pretty bad. chill for a I'm Monday. Right. Yeah. It's been a nice day. It's pretty cruisy. You know, it's been yeah. a nice weekend. You're coming off that weekend high still. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Got that little afterglow still going. Yeah, still totally. Yeah. I had a pretty fun weekend this yeah. weekend, actually. A friend of mine, all COVID restrictions, you know, like protocols in place, of course, uh, had a house party. And I haven't been to a house party in a while. What's hmm. a house party? Pot. Right, <laughs> right, and it's called it was called the loungeathon, which is essentially like we're having a party, but everyone has to rock up in their pajamas or their loungewear, yeah, and we just like sit around a couch the whole time. It was actually perfect. Sounds like a pretty normal weekend you for get me. To, you get to rock up in your uggies. It was fun, and there was two houses next to each other, so you get to hop between the two houses. So it's just like going to a different club or a different wow. area, you know? Yeah, it was pretty fun. That sounds amazing. Yeah. it does. It does. David, what about you? I My weekend, you did a bit of house hunting. Yeah, I know it was not as exciting as this pyjama party um, and <laughs> this is not at all relatable to our millennial and Gen Z audience but I did go house hunting. You're and such an adult now. I know it actually makes me feel like I'm becoming mature somehow. Have you got your shit together? I know. Is this what it feels like? like Never. No. I refuse to believe this. <laughs> no, I refuse I to believe it too. I don't like it either. It's, have... it's not It's not becoming of me. No, but when your <laughs> friends get their shit together, that means that you kind of have to start thinking about getting yeah. your shit together. Oh, it makes me feel very bad about myself. Which so just please makes me just rein it in a bit, David, okay? Because <laughs> yeah, I'm not guys. enjoying no, this. No, get that house. This is confronting. <laughs> <laughs> well, tonight on Wavelength, well, the listeners can't see this, but I'm growing a bit of a mullet again recently. <laughs> and it's for a good cause too, I promise. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll let you guys in on it a bit later. <laughs> We're also going to dissect the recent abortion law changes happening in Texas and how it affects culture here. But next, we're chatting the Paralympics and the beautiful backflip performed by ScoMo this week. <laughs> You're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. Sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having tonight. You're with Hamish, David and Jamie. We hope you're having a brilliant Monday. Uh, so, guys, uh, a big story was, I guess, started this week by uh, SBS, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and they posted an article revealing just how much of a gap there is between the Olympic medalists and the Paralympic medalists. Mm-hmm. So there are certain incentives in place for those who win gold, uh, silver and bronze. Yeah. Um, But here in Australia, Paralympians don't get any sort of monetary uh, incentive, or at least they didn't until very recently. Um, David, do you want to just break down some of the facts for some of the listeners tonight? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. So uh, for Olympians in Australia, if you win an Olympic gold, you get $20,000. If you win a Paralympic gold, you get $0.00. This is sort of compared to, I guess, around the world. Japanese Paralympic gold winners win $27,400. French Paralympic gold winners win $76,200. USA, $37,000. UK don't actually give any money to Olympic Mm. gold medalists or Paralympic gold medalists. So that's interesting as well. (laughs) Um, But I mean, the main reason for this is that Paralympic underpayment is, I guess, because the Paralympics are run by a different body than the Olympians. Uh, They're actually run by Paralympics Australia, which is... I guess, doesn't receive as much funding as the Olympics. But uh, we did get a bit of a backflip from ScoMo this week, right? Yes, yes, that's right. So ScoMo, after this kind of gained a lot of traction um, and there are a lot of, you know, understandably shocked reactions from the public. Uh, Obviously, I don't think a lot of us knew about this uh, or were aware of it. And once (laughs) we were... It really um, started a bit of a fire and there were online campaigns and fundraising efforts. And so ScoMo came out and probably uh, kicked one of the easiest political goals of his career (laughs) and uh, said this. I'm very pleased to announce that the government will provide additional support to Paralympics Australia to ensure our Paralympic medalists will receive equivalent payments to our Olympic medalists, Mr Speaker. 
So that was, yeah, ScoMo speaking uh, in, in Parliament House, announcing that change, which is great. You yeah. know, really fantastic change. Well done. Great totally. job. Um, you know, knocked it out of the park. Uh, sanity prevailed. But uh, it's disappointing that the government had to uh, step in only once the public outcry obviously became such a big deal. Totally. It seems like, and again, like fantastic that this is happening, right? Like, and I feel like a lot more awareness is coming into um, people with disabilities and, you know, the Paralympics in general and just bringing a lot more light to it. But it seems like a big 180 from old ScoMo all of a sudden where all of a sudden he just cares about it. Mm. I want to know his motives. I just want to know, <laughs> do you think this is his last, like, hurrah of trying to get more votes before the next election because he's kind of cooked, he's cooked the vaccine rollout? Well, I mean, you're right. It is an easy goal to win. I mean, he's not having the best time at the moment. Mm. He's royally screwed up the vaccine rollout. The yep. country is mostly in lockdown. The totally. Only, the only thing we have to look forward to are these Olympics and Paralympic games. It's really, even just, they've really just kept like the sparkle in my eye over yeah. the past couple of weeks. Like it's been the one thing that's kind of like keeping us going as a nation, yeah. right? Yes. I forgot it- what nationalism was until this. <laughs> right? like, I just really, it really hated everything until the Olympics came around and the Paralympics. It really has been the glue that has held us together for the last month. <laughs> We're about to have it? a mental breakdown, um, our whole country. I'm, I'm scared <laughs> for the Paralympics to end. Yeah. Because what What then? What next? What but next? yeah. <laughs> it's just, a, it's a, it's a unusual thing for him to do. You know what I yeah. mean? He doesn't normally care about people that aren't liberals. Oh, I don't know. You know? It's sport though. He yeah. loves sport. It's yeah, sport. Yeah, true. And and I think it's one of those things like how can you pose or present an argument against it? No, because it's um, phenomenal. And and yeah, it, it might seem quite liberal from him, but I think the motives are pretty clear. It's um it's not a whole lot of money as well. That's the other thing that no, makes it's it quite not. easy. I mean, at the same time, uh it's thank you Scomo for jumping in. Absolutely. But we did see uh, there's been a fundraiser that has been started by an Olympic gold medalist and AFLW player Chloe Dalton, she raised 75000 in just three days. Wow. Mm. And that's still going to go to the medalists, which is fantastic. Oh, that's amazing. And it shows Australians stepping up to support these Paralympians who deserve to get something from all their hard work. Totally. Yeah, just a little bit probably. But, uh, yeah, look, it's an interesting conversation. Uh, hit us up on the text line if you want to get your opinion heard. Anyway, coming up later in the show, I chat with Evan from the Black Dog Institute about why you might be seeing some more mullets around this month than usual. You're listening to Wavelength. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength with David, Jamie and Hamish tonight, sparking the conversations about Adelaide you should be having. So, David, you've come into the studio this week with a baby mullet. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> it's so gross, hey. Um, so this month is Mullets for Mental Health Month. Uh, so during September, a bunch of people are growing out mullets to raise money for Black Dog Institute, which is an Australian organisation that's like totally at the forefront of research into mental health issues in Australia. So I spoke with Evan Jackson this week, the Senior Manager of Fundraising at Black Dog, all about the initiative. Wavelength. Um, so my name's Evan Jackson. I'm the Senior Manager of Fundraising at the Black Dog Institute. Uh, the Black Dog Institute is the only medical research institute in Australia to investigate mental health uh, across the lifespan. And our aim is to create a mentally healthier world for everyone. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, I've got you on here to first of all chat about mullets for mental health. What a fun mm. idea. I just love the concept. Why mullets though? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, but l- last year during, during, during the, first, the first wave, I'll call it, um, we, we noticed a lot of our fundraisers were doing their own DIY haircut at home, whether it be shaving their head, doing a mohawk, but really the ones that stood out to us um, were, were a few blokes doing a wonderful campaign um, just around their mullets and it really struck a chord with us. Um, so at Mullet HQ as we like to call it now, um, <laughs> Phoebe, Claire, Caitlin, myself got together and thought what what can bring a smile during this, you know, a, a bit distressing time for a lot of Australians and what's a beautiful way to get everybody involved to, you know, start, start participating and giving something back to the community and we thought why not? Let's give mullets an absolute go. We're all Big fans. Um, I was a first-time mullet user last year myself. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, I, and I'll never look back. So really, we thought it's a great cheeky shortcut to a big conversation. So it's a nod to your fellow Australian to say that you're not afraid to lend a supportive ear uh, during times of need. Totally. So that's, that's, how, that's how it all kicked off last year. It's such a quintessential Aussie haircut, isn't it? Obviously, the mullets are one part, but it is a fundraiser after all. So tell me, what are you raising money for at the Black Dog Institute? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really important that we're really transparent about where all the money goes. Um, so, of course, when the campaign debuted last year, it raised more than $3 million to continue our much-needed research studies, education programs, digital tools and clinical services. Um, and all of, the, all of the funds raised go towards our research programs, like such as Under the Radar. Um, so this is a really amazing project that aims to understand the complex barriers of why the unfortunate 50 to 60 percent of uh, people experiencing suicidal thoughts, they don't actually reach out for professional support. So really, by growing your mullet, um, you're helping Black Dog Institute grow our research projects um, to really make sure that we're reaching those at most need. That's fantastic. And so you said that you did it last year. How much did you raise last year and how much are you hoping to raise this year? (laughs) Yeah, last last year I I was very fortunate to raise over $3,000 myself last year, which blew me out of the water. Um, This year I've set another goal of around 2500 and I'm halfway there already. So (sighs) I'm looking. I've, I've, I've gone a little bit more extra this year. Last year I went pink. This year oh, yeah. I've gone for a deep dark blue because I think with with the lockdown extensions, I think I needed to do something a bit more vibrant and it's already gotten a few heads turning as I'm, I'm going out for my one hour of exercise per day. <laughs> I can imagine a deep blue mullet. What a beautiful mm. hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, um, it, I kind of look like either a Smurf or Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Both great things to look like. <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> I mean, it's such a eye-catching way to get people involved. I love the concept of mullets for mental health. Um, definitely a conversation <laughs> starter. How can people get involved in mullets for mental health this month if they're interested in um, p- participating? Yeah. Or even just I donating, think, yeah. Yeah, I think David, the best way to do it, just type in mullets for mental health in any search engine, or you can go to mulletsformentalhealth.org.au. You can also find all of the information at the Black Dog Institute website. That's blackdoginstitute.org.au, and you can find the Mullet HQ button there. Uh, and people can just register for free. We give them tips and tools about how to fundraise and also how to cut in that beautiful, luscious mullet. So <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, we're recommending get online, find that, and, and show us that you're all ears um, for mental health research this year. Oh, it's a great initiative. Uh, Evan, thank you so much for joining me on Wavelength this week, and good luck with that mullet. I'm sure it'll come out nicely by the end of the month. Uh, thank you so much, David, and, and, and good luck with yours. I, I look forward to seeing it online. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. Thanks, mate. Thanks for that, David. Up next, I'll be letting you know all about this week's news. You're listening to Fresh 92.7. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. Now we're cracking into our weekly segment where I explain what the hell has happened this week. What the hell is going on this week? Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. Welcome back to another week of worrying news that's sure to increase anxiety levels by at least 10%. First up, let's just cut straight through the usual COVID news. New South Wales, still screwed. Like, really screwed. Victoria, the same. WA, literally heaven on earth. Premier Gladys Berejiklian announced that despite recording case numbers that resembled a high score in Pac-Man, all restrictions would be rolled back once 70% of the population was fully vaccinated. Well, all except one, home visits. So while they'll all be allowed to go to the pub, they'll also be able to put off going to games night with that weird couple from work. It's a win-win. Meanwhile, across the Nullarbor, Premier Mark McGowan continued to troll some of the highest figures in Australia by declining AFL commentator Eddie Maguire from entering the state for the grand final in a fortnight. Nothing to do with COVID protocols, though. He, like the rest of the country, just doesn't like the guy, with the move all but securing his re-election. A number of US pundits this week took aim at a place that I don't think has ever appeared in their headlines before, South Australia, when we were called a police state by the same country that's currently asking its citizens to dob in those who are having abortions to local authorities. Well, much like a slice of chocolate mud cake from Woolies, that's a bit rich. New COVID cases were recorded in SA after a number of infected truck drivers crossed the border who threatened to go on strike if mandatory vaccinations were put into effect. Because if anyone should get vaccinated, it definitely shouldn't be a bunch of handshaking, chain smoking truck drivers who have a certain distaste for personal hygiene and whose literal job is to visit a new state each day. 
Finally, a Four Corners report this week exposed viewers to the shocking revelation that News Corp media is, and you might want to sit down for this, right-wing propaganda. These claims were then immediately and definitively denied by, surprise, surprise, every News Corp outlet across the country. But I'm sure you can take their word for it. And that's what the hell has been happening this week. Wavelength. <laughs> Thanks for that, Hamish. There's been a lot going on this week again. I mean, like, the new hotspots in SA kind of rattled me a little bit. That was yeah, a bit crazy. Oof. Those dirty truck drivers. Mm. <laughs> I'm just glad that <laughs> it, filthy truck I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm just glad that, you know, like it kind of, it didn't get bad. It could no. have it could have really imploded there. Correction, so. it hasn't got bad I mean, yet. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hey, we've got time. We've got nothing yeah, yeah, but time. Yeah, exactly. Oh, but I remember seeing that. You know, when, when you just hear the news again and you just go, no, every, we were doing so well. Literally every time Facebook pops up with like a list of hotspots, I like sweat, mm. <laughs> like a cold yeah, sweat. Yeah, I become down a hotspot. I think my heart rate, <laughs> um, I think my heart rate goes up by like 30, 30 beats per minute. I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> but hey, so far, so good. Yes, yes. I also want to chat the AFL Grand Final news. Um, yeah. Good for you, Perth. But apparently this, so this week, Christopher Pine, mm. uh, the ex-federal liberal mm, MP. Yes. He wrote a sort of letter asking for the historic scoreboard at Adelaide Oval to be either moved or destroyed. Yeah. What? Yes. Mm. Are you serious? I saw that. One, Christopher Pine speaking on anything AFL related right? just feels <laughs> horribly underqualified to speak on anything of that matter at all. I mean, he's the last person I'd ever go to uh, uh, about a topic like that. Literally. And second of all, his argument was, yeah, to to remove the scoreboard or, or uh, not demolish it. He wants it to be um, moved, still kept intact, but outside the stadium, just as a, what? just ornamental, basically. <sighs> Um, because he thinks that base, if we can fill that missing stand where the scoreboard is, we might have more of a chance of getting the grand final in the future. Forgetting the fact that the grand final is literally locked in at the MCG for <laughs> the next 100 years. Literally. Like, just rogue. Like, look, growing up and going to see the test cricket, going to watch the AFL, I used to love that scoreboard. Mm. And it makes me sound like a boomer, but I will <laughs> throw a hissy fit if I oh. even try and budge that by a centimetre. I will paint the town red. Don't it's, you worry. It's quintessential like the Moles Bowls, you yes. know? Yes. It's, it's a landmark. Adelaide. You don't mess with it. You don't mess it with it. It is a landmark of Adelaide. Mm. You're listening to Wavelength. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength. Sparking all the conversations you should be having. You're with Hamish, David and Jamie. So earlier on in the show, we got to hear from Evan Jackson from the Black Dog Institute about mullets for mental health. Yes. Guys, what do you think of the fundraiser? I think it's a really cool initiative. I think yeah. it's creative and fun and it's just kind of like engaging people in a new way. Everyone loves a mullet. They're funny. <laughs> mullets aren't like, I think if, any, if the 80s has proven anything, mullets aren't going anywhere. You know, mm, like yeah. they're here for a while, but it's nice. It's good to see people... It's sparking new ways to talk about a really important issue that's not going away. It's not. Yeah, and I like it. It's it's lighthearted. Um, it's a bit of fun, which is great. Uh, but the only thing is that, yeah, there just seems to be these, uh, you know, new initiatives all the time um, to raise awareness, which is mm. great because, you know, awareness does need to be raised. But it still seems like a lot of people are still very reluctant to actually go beyond just that. Uh, base level of raising awareness and, totally. you know, dive deeper into the conversation. Well, look, so in Australia, one in five of us will experience symptoms of mental illness in any given year. And in Australia, that's roughly 5 million people. And roughly 60% of these 5 million people won't seek help. So it's great that we're doing these fantastic initiatives like Marts for Mental Health. I think it's a lot of fun. I'm going to do it myself. Mm. But why is it that there's still 60% of people that experience mental health symptoms totally. that aren't getting the help they want or aren't looking for that help either. Yeah, it seems like um, we're, we're raising more and more awareness around this topic uh, year after year after year, which is great. You know, such an important part of, uh, in breaking down the stigma. Uh, it seems like awareness has gone up a whole lot. But the, um, I guess, willingness to go and actually seek help for it hasn't really Moved a whole no. lot, has it? No, no. I, I honestly reckon it's it's still to like due to lack of government support. I think that like there's not enough support around. Say people like share about these issues and they talk to someone, they talk to their boss about like having mental health issues. There's not really any. You can't take leave for mental health issues the same way. There's no like there's no like payment structure. There's no like government funding for that. I think people are still scared about like 
once you admit something like this, the ricochet of their lives and how that affects them. Mm. There's still not enough education either. Like we get, it's getting better and the educational system's like really quickly adapting and, and evolving. But it's just, it needs to be something that needs, like that should be talked about from birth. Like yeah. it should be this really normalised conversation that we're having where it's like we all have mental health issues at one point of our lives. Well, it is a bit taboo still. And I, I, I do find it odd because there are so many initiatives. Like, look, I'm pretty sure like Are You OK Day is coming up. It is, There's like yeah. constantly, like you said, there's so many initiatives. We've got months of mental health month. Like there are so many things that we're doing to talk about this. And it totally. is clearly a mainstream conversation. We're talking about it on the radio. Like it is a mainstream conversation. Mm. But still, I just can't get over the fact that 60% of people won't seek help for mental health problems. And it does, you can get help. Exactly. And I think you nailed uh, nailed it on the head there, David, that um, we are talking about it. We are. Like, here we are right now on radio having a chat about mental health. It, it is a very mainstream conversation these days. But that's not being reflected in the amount of people who are going and getting help. There's still something that is, is there's still a problem there, isn't mm, there? There's still definitely. some sort of obstacle there that people aren't able to overcome despite how much easier it's we still got a long way to go but how much easier it has become to talk about these things and i think jamie's right it's a legislative thing there there still aren't enough uh, isn't enough support put in place you know like i don't want to get too personal but when you're struggling and and you think maybe i do want to get some help the whole prospect of having to book in a doctor's appointment mm. Have a chat with a doctor. Yes, we've got the mental health care plan, which is great, and that's so mm, awesome. Which totally. you know entitles you to what six, uh, you know, therapy sessions. But I think it's ten. Yeah, ten. But what if you're not, you know, what if you're not feeling low enough to, you know, think that you qualify for a mental health care plan? You know, that's the kind of stuff that is. You've got to go to a doctor and kind of justify why you need to be put on that mental health care plan. Why can't you just say, look, I just want to talk to someone? Totally. Oh. You've got to prove it, if anything. And I feel yeah. like that's a really big pressure that's put on us. And also, with this pandemic and COVID, things have gotten a hell of a lot worse and harder to talk about it too. Like, it's like, it's a public health care system issue now, really. And like... It's a lot harder to like have Zoom sessions and talking to a therapist. Like we are taking away this like one-to-one -one interaction with a human, another human being seeking help. It, it takes away, it takes away the quality of the help that you're getting. Like it's hard to talk to a screen and it doesn't, it's not effective. It's not effective in the same way that yeah. having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with someone face-to-face -face works, you know? Um, you did say something there that just made me want to say something uh, about maybe... I'm not sick enough or maybe I'm not mentally unwell enough to go get therapy. Look, I, I get that, but it, it's you, it's your mental health. You should look, look after yourself. And if you're feeling down, if you're feeling depressed, please go talk to a therapist. They're not there just for people with severe mental illnesses. They're there to talk to you. They're there to help you out and to help you through things that you're going through. And I fully recommend therapy. Uh, I, I think it's great. I've gone through a few times. Yeah. I, it helps. It Absolutely, helps. it does. And, and I've gone through th therapy myself as well. Um, but it is an ordeal. There is a process. There is a lot of, uh, you know, hoops to jump through yeah. before, uh, you know, the government will step in and actually front the bill for uh, totally. those kind of services. Um, but, but but yeah, it's it's something that you do just need to do. I agree, David. If you're feeling like that, just take the plunge and go for it. You're listening to Wavelength. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. You're with Hamish, David and Jamie. So Hamish, you mentioned with your what the hell is happening this week segment already, but I want to talk about it more. And this is the anti-abortion laws in Texas that came in last week. Yeah, that's right. So... The new laws came in, some facts about that. So now you only have six weeks to get an abortion legally, which is like mm. very short period of time. Like some... there's a lot of, like you wouldn't know you're pregnant a lot of the time in that period. Oh, six weeks is not <laughs> for, like from a, it's not a lot, a lot of time to know that you've missed a period. Let me tell oh, you, yeah. <laughs> that is a, not enough leeway. It's a very small window, isn't it? So <sighs> essentially you've got two weeks because you'd, you'd be like one month and then the two weeks... Yeah, it's, and it's, it's really not, natural for yeah. a woman to be late on the period by two weeks. Like that's that's just well within a normal cycle. Right, exactly. In addition, um, people in Texas can be sued and arrested for getting an abortion and also everyone associated. So let's say you're going to get your abortion, you get a taxi on the way there. A taxi driver can be sued as well for facilitating the abortion. <laughs> uh, also, anyone in Texas can sue you too. So the neighbor on the street who knows that you got an abortion can sue you. If you got an abortion, uh, the therapist that helped you work through it can also be sued. Great. And <laughs> like, 
And also, it's also a lesser penalty um, for raping someone than it is now to get an abortion in Texas. So that's what the that's what we're dealing with here. I uh, this look. This is <laughs> this gets me angry every time I talk about it. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like this is a war on women. The the fact that someone can rape a person and get a lesser penalty than the person that's been raped and wants to get an abortion is absolutely ridiculous. Like if you're if you know that someone in your street's got an abortion, you can sue them. That's ridiculous. And the partners involved and like anyone that's gotten support, like the initiative is so backwards. Like it's just at what point do these extremist laws stop? Like it's mm. just baffling that these laws have been passed. It's ridiculous. And it made me think about the laws that are happening here in Australia because at the moment it's all decriminalised, so right, it's all okay. legal, right? Yeah. But South Australia was actually the last state to decriminalise it wow. and it happened this year. So in January of 2021, they actually became decriminalized. But what I do love from this story about abortion laws in Texas was that lots of TikTok activists have actually <laughs> Okay, so let me just So there's a website, Gotta right? Love that there's sentence. a website called TikTok Pro Life, activists. right? There's a website called Pro Life Abortion, which essentially like is giving people the platform to dob in people that have had abortions. Oh, so it's essentially so like a tip-off sued. site, yeah, totally, so yeah. they can be sued. And all of these, all of these people from TikTok have started spamming this website with false information. Like they've started putting in false claims about you know the the person that enacted these laws, saying that like he he's gotten like twenty abortions, like just like just phony <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> just kind of like putting it back in their face. And they've he's also started right and center. <laughs> yeah, totally. But also like they've been spamming it with like Shrek porn. And, oh, like, excuse like, me. Yeah, yeah, like wild Shrek wild, porn. Yeah, Shrek My porn. I didn't category. even know that was a thing. With like false information sure on didn't. this whistleblower site. <laughs> That's so it's exactly what I know. someone who's into Shrek porn would say. <laughs> <laughs> Rhymes with shush motion. No, mm. it's just stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy that that these people are doing it. But also like good on them. Like yes, because at the moment, like it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You can dob someone in. It's very interesting. I the younger it. generation really, truly do come up with very creative ways to uh, screw the system, don't they? <laughs> I don't know uh, what ends that's going to achieve, but. It's a good laugh, isn't it? What, it is what worries me the most is that there's enough Shrek porn that you can flood a website with. It. Yeah. That, is, that is worrying. That's... Yes, that is worrying. And on next week's episode, <laughs> we will be investigating the Shrek porn <laughs> pandemic. Uh, anyway, you're listening to Wavelength. Wavelength. Anyway, that brings us to the end of the show tonight. Thanks for listening. So earlier in the show, we spoke about the pay inequality between Olympians and Paralympians. And on a past episode, Hamish spoke with local uh, film director Hamish Ludbrook about his documentary called No Distinguishing Features, which featured a number of people living with disability, including one of our own Paralympians, Rowan Crothers. He was born with cerebral palsy, and he was actually one of the people that Hamish spoke to. Uh, this year, he won two gold medals, one in the S1050 metre freestyle and one in the 100 metre freestyle relay. He also won silver in the S1000 metre freestyle Congratulations, Rowan, of course. But No Distinguishing Features is now available to stream everywhere through SBS On Demand. Here's a little bit of our chat with Hamish when he came on the show last year. When you talk to people kind of who grew up in the 50s and 60s, a lot of them will say, like, I just never saw anyone with a disability. I think a lot of people's prejudice really just does come from ignorance. And so I hope that's the role that this film, you know, might serve. And all of the other great, you know, content coming out on on disability is just the just to educate people because I think that's it. Once you once you know them, once you've laughed at them, once you've learned about mm. their story, I mean, yeah, I think that fear can wash away for a lot of people. You can hear the full chat along with all our previous episodes on the Wavelength podcast. Make sure you're subscribed to the Wavelength podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and anywhere else that you get your podcasts. You can listen back to our old episodes right now and you'll be the first to know when tonight's episode goes up. Now, next week, we've got another great show for you where we talk about the decriminalisation of sex work and the new regulations that have been proposed. That's right. Thanks so much for joining me this week, David and Jamie. I uh, hope you have a great week and uh, we'll join you again next Monday. We'll see you guys then. You're listening to Wavelength. Wavelength. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.